Saratoga. Today, the name evokes thoughts of championship thoroughbred racing, of crowds, excitement, and competition. But centuries ago, the country's elite flocked to Saratoga to sample the water, the baths, the art, and the cool, rejuvenating mountain air. Back in the early days, the only problem was a lack of entertainment. But in 1863, they found a new pleasure at the upstate New York resort, one which would become synonymous with the town itself, the racing. A four-day meeting kicked off this now century-old tradition and proved so popular that a new race course was constructed the following year to house the crowds which would no doubt flock to this new meeting. And flock they did. Celebrities, governors, and the cream of society came to see the races at Saratoga. They made the meeting's championship race a household word in its own right. Named for the track's first president, who won its inaugural running, the race is now the oldest continually run stakes race for three-year-olds in the United States. For 125 years, it has caused upsets, created controversy, and crowned champions. This is the Traverse Stakes, the Midsummer Derby. The most memorable upset in Saratoga history occurred in the 1930 Travers, billed as a virtual match race between Triple Crown winner Gallant Fox and which one? A crowd of 30,000, including Governor and future President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, flocked to the spa. The race was so popular that some abandoned their automobiles up to two miles away to walk to the track. The favorite in the field of four was Gallant Fox at three to five. Which one, a winner of three stakes at the meeting, was second choice at seven to five. The field was rounded out by Sun Falcon at 30 to one and Jim Dandy, the 100 to one outsider. From the start, the two favorites engaged in a speed duel with Sonny Workman on which one on the rail and Earl Sandy aboard the favorite on the outside. Together, they raced down the back stretch and turning for home, Workman swung the pair wide, opening the rail for Jim Dandy who shot through to win by eight lengths under jockey Red Baker. Jim Dandy went on to race until 1939, and though he had little success on the track, his impact on the Travers and on Saratoga would echo through the years. Man of War had a great impact on racing too, winning the Travers in 1920. He may have been the most famous horse to do so, but the only triple crown champion to capture the race was Whirlaway in 1941. But in the decades that followed, Saratoga played host to a parade of champions. In the 1950s, it was the Grey Ghost, Native Dancer, who lost just one race, the Kentucky Derby. Native Dancer was tremendously popular, partly because of his visibility. He was easy to follow on the black and white sets of the day, and when viewers tuned in for the 53 Travers, they saw a typical performance. After taking command on the turn, he drew off to a five and a half length victory. Like Native Dancer, Gallant Man also lost the Kentucky Derby, but his defeat became infamous as Bill Shoemaker misjudged the finish line. In the Travers, number two Popcorn was the unlucky horse stumbling and falling at the start. But no one was going to beat Gallant Man that day. His half-length victory was a handy one under mile urging by Shoemaker, and his time of two minutes and four seconds was described as sensational over a deep and resurfaced racetrack. Hall of Fame trainer Elliot Birch saddled four Travers winners in a 13-year span. He started his run with Sword Dancer in 1959. That was followed by Quadrangle in 1964, then Arts and Letters in 1969, and finally, Key to the Mint in 1972. Birch's first Travers victor, Sword Dancer, was also his first champion. Owned by the Brookmead Stable, Sword Dancer was champion three-year-old and horse of the year in 1959. Three years later, Birch was offered the job as trainer of Paul Mellon's Rokeby Stable. And in 1964, he won his first of three Travers for Rokeby with Quadrangle. Over a sloppy racetrack, a tiring but determined Quadrangle was able to hold off Knightly Manor to win by a half length. The winning jockey that afternoon was Manuel Icaza, who was also aboard Sword Dancer. 
perch and Ikaza celebrated while the traditional canoe in the infield lake got its first dose of Rokeby yellow and gray. On the eve of the 1969 Travers, Elliot Birch said that Arts and Letters was not only the best horse he ever trained, but perhaps the best horse anyone ever trained. So well regarded was he when he came into the Travers that Arts and Letters was sent off at one to five, and he had no trouble handling his four opponents with Braulio by Isa aboard. Like Quadrangle before him, Arts and Letters had failed in the Derby and Preakness, but the Belmont kicked off a string of stakes victories, which earned him champion three-year-old, handicap horse, and horse of the year honors in 1969. He remains the last national champion to win the Travers. Coming into the third Saturday in August of 1972, Birch was again on a roll. He had already won the Whitney with Key to the Mint and the Alabama with Summer Guest. The Travers was next, and Birch, Baeza, and Mellon combined to win it with Key to the Mint. The victory helped propel him to three-year-old honors. He would be Birch's last Travers winner. Elliot Birch wasn't the only trainer to dominate the Travers. Bert Mulholland won the race five times, more than any other trainer. His most famous Travers winner by far was Jiper. Earlier in the summer, the Colts had given owner George Widener his first and only Belmont Stakes victory. In the 1962 Travers, Jiper faced six opponents. Christiana Stable sent out the entry of number one Cyan and number one A Spark. Mrs. Moody Jolly's Rydan, ridden by Manuel Icaza, wore saddle cloth number two, but he would leave from post position number one. The favorite Jiper, odds on and ridden by Bill Shoemaker, was number three and broke from post position two. Number four in the field was Military Plume with Johnny Sellers in the irons. There was a filly in the 1962 Travers and that was Sakata, number five, with Bobby Ussery up. Number six, and rounding out the field, was the longest shot on the board, Flying Johnny. There were seven horses in the field, but Rydan and Jiper were certainly the class, as Leroy Jolly remembers. Well, they were both very, very talented horses, and, uh, you know, they were actually, I think, probably standouts in the field, as I remember it. Uh, Sykata ran in the race, who was a very, very good filly and had run a very good race in the Florida Derby that winter. Uh, Rydan beat her a nose or a head or something. But uh, by the time we got into the middle of August and the Travers, why uh, Rydan and Jiper were both very good horses that had accomplished a great deal. And they, at that time, I think were pretty well standouts in the field. The scene was set for a great Travers, one that will be remembered for a long, long time. Well, it was a very exciting race, and uh, you know, it was one of those things where you had two very, very good horses and uh, two great jockeys, two very good horses, and uh, they just locked up in one of those situations that you rarely ever see. And uh, not only lock up that way together, so close together and finish that way, but to do it for a full mile and a quarter with 126 pounds and to break a track record that was set by Man of War was certainly a very exciting situation. Standing very nicely, and they're off. That's Jiper with Rydan along the inside, head and head for the lead. Smart moving on the outside, now third. Flying Johnny fourth, Cyane fifth. Military Plume sixth, and Cicada is seventh. Go by the stand, Rydan on the rail with Jiper head and head for the lead. A gap of four lengths, that's Smart in third position. Gap of two lengths, comes Cyane with Cicada, Flying Johnny, and Military Plume is seventh. Swing around the clubhouse turn, Rydan on the inside with Jiper still head and head for the lead. Gap of five lengths, Cyane moving in the third position. Cicada now fourth, Smart fifth. Flying Johnny sixth, gap of five lengths, and Military Plume is last. They go into the back stretch that way. Jiper on the outside and ride down along the rail, still head and head for the lead. Cyane third, Cicada alongside fourth. Gap of five lengths, Smart is fifth. 
Flying Johnny sixth, and Military Plume is last. Going the half mile pole, it's right down on the inside in front by half a length with Jiper alongside. Along the rail, Cyane third, Cicada fourth. Flying Johnny fifth, Smart sixth, and Military Plume is seventh. At the 3 8 pole, Jiper moves up right alongside with Rydan still head and head. Along the rail, Cyan now a closer third. Cicada fourth. Smart is fifth. Flying Johnny sixth. And Military Plume is seventh. Coming into the stretch, that's Jiper out in the middle of the track. Cyan along the rail with Rydan. Coming through the stretch now, that's Jiper and Rydan still battling for the lead. Military Plume on the far outside coming on with Smart and Cyan. Now coming to the 16th pull, it's Jiper and Rydan still battling head and head. And as they go over the finish line, it's a photograph for the win. Jiper had prevailed over Rydan by a nose, but only the photo finish camera could separate the pair. Forced to miss the triple crown due to a quarter crack, Buck Passer was faultless following his return to the races. In the Travers, he would face Amberoy, who upset Kawhi King's hopes for a triple crown in the Belmont Stakes. And Buffle, who captured the Suburban against older horses and had run second to Buck Passer in the Brooklyn. As the three to 10 favorite with stablemates stupendous in the Travers, Buck Passer wore down Amberoy with a strong stretch run to score a three quarter length victory in the 10 furlong classic. The win was his eighth of 13 consecutive victories in 1966 on his way to Horse of the Year honors. Coming into the 1967 Travers, no horse had ever won the race by a margin of more than 10 lengths. But Damascus, the one to five favorite that year, would smash the old mark, winning by 22 lengths on a sloppy oval, equaling the track record and propelling him to three-year-old handicap horse and Horse of the Year titles. His stamina was remarkable. Damascus ran 16 times as a three-year-old on dirt and turf in distances ranging from six furlongs to two miles, and he swept the last two legs of the Triple Crown. Cornelius Vanderbilt Sonny Whitney is one of five owners to win three or more Travers Stakes. In 1968, Whitney had champion and Champion had his racetrack. A typical Saratoga downpour the morning of the race left the track muddy and Champion reveled in it. Wearing saddlecloth number five, Champion came from off the pace, wore down Derby and Preakness winner forward pass and captured the 99th running of the Midsummer Derby by a length and three quarters. Champion joined his sire, Tompion, and Fisherman as Travers winners for C.B. Whitney. Purchased for $600,000 at the 1973 Keeneland Summer Sale, Wajima, one of the last sons of Bold Ruler, was looking to become the first record-priced yearling to earn an Eclipse Award. He got off to a slow start in 1975, missing the classics due to a splint, and trainer Steve DeMauro hoped to make up some ground in the summer and fall races. The plan worked. By July, Wajima was on a roll, sweeping five straight stakes en route to the three-year-old championship. The easiest of those victories was the Travers, which he took by 10 lengths. Trainer Leroy Jolly had high hopes for honest pleasure in the 1976 Triple Crown races. He was odds-on in the Derby, but couldn't catch front-running bowl Forbes. He faded to fifth in the Preakness after a suicidal speed duel with the Derby winner. Honest Pleasure was looking for redemption in the Traverse Stakes, and he got it. Dave Johnson picks up the call. Honest Pleasure has the lead by a length and three quarters. Here comes Dance Spell on the outside, second by a head. Quiet Little Table is third, Romeo on the inside is fourth. Majestic Light is fifth and El Portuguese as they come to the 16th pole. Honest Pleasure holding on to the lead by two and a half. Romeo is second and Dance Spell on the outside. It's Honest Pleasure in front. Honest Pleasure's four length victory over Romeo came in track record time of two minutes and a fifth for trainer Jolly and owner Bertram Firestone. Little did Saratoga racing fans know that the 77 Travers 
would foreshadow the famed Ali Dar and affirmed matchup one year later. The 108th running of the Midsummer Derby lured a then record crowd of more than 35,000. The top three choices in the race, number one Silver Series, number nine Jatski, and number 11 Run Dusty Run, all came to Saratoga from the Midwest in the absence of Triple Crown champ Seattle Slough. All three horses came out running with Silver Series in front, followed by Run Dusty Run and Jatski. As the trio entered the stretch, they were separated by less than a length. And now Run Dusty Run had a narrow lead over Jatski. And here's where the bumping began. As the slow motion video shows, Run Dusty Run, with Daryl McCarg aboard, bears out repeatedly through the stretch and continually bumps Jatski and Sam Maple. Run Dusty Run crossed the finish line first, but the stewards immediately posted the inquiry sign. Run Dusty Run would be disqualified, and Jatski declared the winner. It was the first disqualification in the Travers in more than 60 years, but it wouldn't be the last. Affirmed versus Alidar. It was perhaps the most memorable and dramatic rivalry in racing history. One that started early in their two-year-old year and carried through the 1978 Triple Crown, forever linking their names. Heading into the Travers, Affirmed had won seven of their nine meetings. But John Beach thought his colt, Alidar, was ready to win the big one. I thought we had an excellent shot of beating Affirmed in the Travers. Uh, Aladar's race in the Whitney was, was brilliant. Running against J.O. Tobin, who was a, a cracked four-year-old, uh, he, he really demolished him. He came out of the Belmont stronger than, I, than he went into the Belmont, I thought. It, his race at Arlington Park against very weak competition was also a, a very brilliant effort. So we were very, very pleased. And after watching Affirm run in the Jim Dandy and seeing him kind of struggle against some horses that he'd beaten convincingly early in the year, uh, I was very encouraged. Uh, and uh, Aladar came up to the race in just, just in great order. Trained well, seemed to thrive on, on the environment of Saratoga. A record crowd of 50,359 turned out in perfect weather to see the race. Made even more dramatic when a firm's regular jockey, Steve Cawthon, hurt his knee and was replaced by Lafitte Pinkai Jr. Here's Chick Anderson's call. And they're off for the lead. Shake, shake, shake on the inside. Nasty and bold now. Affirmed is on the outside with Alidar. And they pass the stands. Nasty and bold along the inside. Affirmed on the outside. Those two are heads apart. Alidar is a very close third on the outside. Then back along the rail. Nasty and bold. They move into the turn. The first quarter in a leisurely 24 and 1. And the leader along the inside, shake, shake, shake by just a neck. On the outside, affirmed to second, going under good restraint. Then two lengths back, now a length and a half, Ali Dar in third. And Nasty and Bold remains a very close fourth as they make their way down the back stretch. Affirmed on the outside, puts a head in front. Shake, shake, shake. Ali Dar is along the rail, and he's moving up along the rail. And a half went at about the same. 48 seconds. The pace is still slow. Down the back stretch, Ali Dar will force the issue with Affirmed on the outside. It's Affirmed holding the lead by a head. On the inside, Ali Dar has the rail and will challenge him from that position. Then it's a gap of two. Ali Dar suddenly has dropped back very suddenly and appears to be out of the race. Here's Nasty and Bold getting through. Ali Dar is back in stride once again. It is coming on again. On the turn, affirmed, and Ali Dar will make a run at him on the outside in second. Nasty and Bold in third, and the trailer is shake, shake, shake. Three quarters in 111 and three, and they're in the stretch. In the stretch, affirmed and Alidar on the outside. Affirmed on the inside, nasty and bold third down along the rail, but affirmed continues to maintain control of the pace. It's affirmed, and he has it by a length and a half. Alidar driving, can't catch him on the outside. Nasty and bold is third. 
Everyone knew something had happened on the far turn, and the inquiry sign was posted, with a firm's number blinking. The tower camera on the turn shows what transpired. With a firm racing in front, Pinkai moved abruptly to the inside, dropping over on Alidar. This caused George Velasquez to check sharply and severely take up his mount. Alidar dropped back several lengths, and some of the onlookers, including Veach, thought he might have been injured. I, I was very concerned watching it happen because I, I was in a position where I really couldn't see my, the angle that I was looking at from, and I didn't know whether he, had, he looked as if he bobbled and, and then came up, and oft times when a horse does that, he's broken his leg. Ali Dar was okay, but the original order of finish was not. A firm's number was taken down, replaced by Ali Dar. The victory was bittersweet, and it remains so for trainer John Beach. It was a win, but not a win. It, it is, even to date, to think about disappointing. It, uh, I was younger then, and, but certainly have not lost my enthusiasm, but uh, Aladar meant so much to me. He was my first, my first love. You know, it's like your first kiss. And my first derby horse, uh, my first world-class horse, uh, particularly as a colt. And I, I was so proud of him. And it was so exciting. The Triple Crown was exciting, but the Traverse was going to be where Aladar justified himself. And uh, to have it end that way, it was bitter then and bitter now. The queen of the 1979 racing season was Calumet Farms' Devona Dale, winner of the Philly Triple Crown, who was trained by John Beach. Despite losing the Alabama a week earlier, Devona Dale was sent off the Travers' favorite. But Hurt Firestone's General Assembly showed no respect for the opposition, male or female. This ground level, slow motion shot of the race shows General Assembly breaking well from the rail. The son of Secretariat, out of a native dancer mare, had a three length lead after three quarters of a mile. And his lead increased at every pole. It was six lengths into the stretch, and at the wire, General Assembly had raced to a 15-length victory over Smarton. Private account finished third, and the Philly Devona Dale settled for fourth. While destroying the field over a sloppy track, General Assembly, with a Cinto Vasquez riding, established a stakes and track record of two minutes flat, a mark that still stands today. For Temperance Hill, the Travers represented opportunity, a chance to regain the stature he had lost since his stunning upset of genuine risk in the Belmont. Winless in three starts following his Belmont victory at odds of 53 to one, Temperance Hill proved once again that he loved a distance of ground. In the early going of the Travers, he was far back, breaking last in the field of nine. But under Eddie Maple, Temperance Hill began to rally on the far turn. He had moved to the inside and was within striking distance at the 316th pole. With his strong late running style, Temperance Hill proved clearly the best, with first Albert finishing second and the early pace setter Amber Pass third. Victories in both the Belmont Stakes and the Travers helped springboard Temperance Hill to an Eclipse Award as the champion three-year-old Colt of 1980. Simply said, the 1981 Travers was contested over a quagmire. The track was sloppy, but the field was one of the strongest in years. It included a matchup fans had looked forward to since the Triple Crown races. Kentucky Derby and Preakness winner Pleasant Colony was to take on Lord Avey, the two-year-old champion who missed the Triple Crown due to injury. Adding spice to the field was Belmont Stakes winner, Summing. But it was not a day for the favorites. In the end, it would be the lightly regarded winner of the Jim Dandy, Willow Hour, 
who would add to Saratoga's reputation as the graveyard of favorites. At 24 to 1 odds, Willow Hour on the inside held off Pleasant Colony to win by a head with Lord Avey a fast closing third. Eddie Maple had his second straight Travers win, while Willow Hour joined Arts and Letters as the only horse to take both the Jim Dandy and Travers. For the second straight year, Saratoga and the Travers played host to a major upset. The Travers assembled the first ever meeting of the three winners of the Triple Crown. There was Gatto del Sol, the Kentucky Derby winner. Aloma's ruler who missed the Derby and came back to win the Preakness. And Conquistador Cielo, winner of the Met Mile and Belmont Stakes in a five day span. He had recently been syndicated for a world record $36.4 million, but his physical condition was questioned when he came onto the track wearing front bandages. Here's Marshall Cassidy's call of the race. And they're off. On the far outside, as expected, a Loma's ruler goes to the front. It's Conquistador Cielo moving up on the inside. They are going together past the stands, but a Loma's ruler does have the lead by a half. Conquistador Cielo along the inside is right alongside. They will enter the clubhouse turn together. And right behind them, surprisingly, is Gato del Sol. Then it's Le Jolie in th fourth, and Runaway Groom is fifth. The first quarter was run in a very fast 23 and 2 fifth seconds. It's Aloma's ruler on the outside, has the lead by about a half. Eddie Maple on Conquistador Cielo has a good hold. He's on the rail in second. He's letting Aloma's ruler show the way. And Conquistador Cielo has about four lengths on Gato del Sol. Then it's Le Jolie and Runaway Groom. The long shot remains in fifth. The half. Still a very, very fast pace. It's 46 and 2. Aloma's ruler on the outside continues to lead. And Conquistador Cielo is only inches behind as they approach the far turn. About four back is now La Jolie gaining on the rail, moving into third. And Gato del Sol is back into fourth. Aloma's ruler on the outside. Conquistador Cielo on the rail. They are heads apart. Three quarters, 10 and 3. Conquistador Cielo, Aloma's ruler. They remain together. They have three on La Jolie, but La Jolie is making up lots of ground. They're at the top of the stretch. The mile and 35 and four. Aloma's ruler stays in front. And on the inside, Conquistador Cielo. And now Conquistador Cielo puts ahead in front. Aloma's ruler on the outside is second. And runaway groom from Canada moves up. Runaway Groom alongside the inner two. Those three to the wire. Runaway Groom. Aloma's ruler, Conquistador Cielo. Runaway Groom in front. The lightly regarded Runaway Groom came down from Canada to post the surprise. With Jeff Bell in the saddle, Runaway Groom stunned the crowd at odds of almost 13 to 1. The infield canoe now had a distinct Canadian flavor. Racing fans of all ages have always enjoyed the splendor and the beauty that is distinctly Saratoga. For more than 100 years and still today, Saratoga is without question the August place to be. In 1983, many spectators came to see the Travers, Angel Cordero, and the late developing Slew of Gold. Also gaining attention was Preakness winner Deputed Testimony. But the day belonged to the Chicago-based Playfellow. With Slew of Gold and Hyperborean contesting the early pace, Pat Day, aboard Playfellow, was content to sit off the pace for the first three quarters of a mile before asking his colt to run. And run he did. Playfellow caught the leaders near the 16th pole and drew clear. It gave Pat Day his first of three Travers winners in the 1980s. The Travers is often called the beginning of the second season, and that was certainly true in 1984. The three-year-old ranks, decimated by a career-ending injury to Devil's Bag and the death of Swale, found a new star in Cardin Askra, who swept through both the Jim Dandy and the Travers for trainer Dick Lundy. In the winner's circle, 
Lundy and jockey Lafitte Pinkai accepted the Travers Trophy from New York Governor Mario Cuomo. Jockey Angel Cordero has done it all at Saratoga, including this sensational display of horsemanship in 1975. Angel is now the king of the spa, but that wasn't always the case. Well, the first year I went to Saratoga was in 1962. I was there for the first month, and I was forced to go back to Puerto Rico because I could ride. I rode one horse. Uh, then I went back in 63, and the same thing happened. I had to go back before the meeting was finished. I went back in 64, and I failed again. I was there for this time. I was there for almost three weeks, and I ran out of money, and I went back to Puerto Rico. Then I came back to 65 to United States again, and I decided to stay no matter what happened. I uh, didn't did any great in 65 or 66, but in 67, I did very good. And I promised to myself, I said, if I ever do good in the United States, I want to win in Saratoga, because it's, it's very prestige meeting. Most of the owners go there, the good horses run there. Uh, I suffer a lot there. I slept on the car most of the time, and I jump a lot of meals. So it was like kind of challenge for me. I said, well, I suffer a lot here in Saratoga. I said, one day I'll be here. And I used to kid around with my friend. I said, one day I'll be a champion. They used to laugh at me. I said, well, it could be, it could happen. And I really concentrate when I go there. I work real hard. I ride most of the races every day. I keep my weight low there. And um, I've been very fortunate. I've been very lucky. I used to go there and get days a lot, you know, and it's hard to get, we used to get 10 days years ago, and it's hard to get 10 days on a 24-day meeting. Um, first time I rent a big house, I didn't even get my money back. And then every year when I go there, I always tell my family I want to rent a house with a swimming pool and I want to reach, I want to live like a rich guy. And when I get there, I really work real hard. And I've been very fortunate uh, to win 14, uh, 14 meetings over there, especially 11 meetings on a row. I really concentrate there. I think it's the best race in, in, in America. Uh, I don't think it's any other place like Saratoga. As Cordero guided Chief's crown into the starting gate for the 85 Travers, it seemed hard to believe he had yet to win Saratoga's most prestigious race. Early in the year, it looked as if he would have a good shot, for Cordero was the rider of Spendabuck, leader of the three-year-old division whom he had ridden to victory in the Kentucky Derby. But Spendabuck passed up the Travers in favor of the Monmouth Handicap, which he won by a nose that same day. Cordero elected to stay with Chief's crown for the race that meant so much to him. It was something very special to me. I got uh, some good chance before, like Track Baron and uh, Slew Go. I got beaten known on some Pleasant Colony in the travel. And it was something that it was bugging me, that I could win every race in America and not the travel. And I did have some good mounts in the travel. I can't blame it on the horses. It was just an unlucky that I never got there on time. And uh, when I got on Chief Crown, I just lost the mount on a spender box, so I was really keen into it. And I thought he was coming to Saratoga, and I thought I could beat him. And when Spender Buck didn't show up, I, I felt the very confidence that I was going to win. And when I finally win on Chief Crown, it was like taking a big load out of your back. I, I accomplished something that I tried for so many years and failed on him. And I re really felt the very release, and I felt that like I accomplished almost everything in racing. As the field moved around the far turn, Cordero had Chief's crown poised to make his move. Don's Choice on the outside now takes the lead, and on the, there goes Skip Trial alongside. Skip Trial now takes the lead, Don's Choice alongside in second, on the rail is Turkle Mountain in third by two, then the Chief's crown. They approach the top of the stretch. Stephens Odyssey still far back in sixth. Skip Trial on the outside leads by a neck, Turco Man on the rail in second. There goes Chief's crown on the outside. Skip Trial has the lead by a neck. Turco Man comes on again. Chief's Crown gaining ground on the outside. Uptown Swell on the rail in fourth. There's Stephens Odyssey on the outside. They pass the eighth pole. Chief's Crown, last year's two-year-old champion, now takes the lead. Turco Man is second. Skip Trial is back into third. Then Stephens Odyssey. It's Chief's Crown in front. Cordero's accomplishments at Saratoga were complete, and he marked the occasion with his traditional celebratory leap. Whatever the weather conditions, the sun always shines on someone in Saratoga, especially around Travers time. And in 1986, everything came up roses for young trainer Phil Gleaves. He took on his longtime mentor, Woody Stevens, 
the man who saddled five straight Belmont Stakes winners. Oddly enough, Stevens had never won the Travers, but he looked to end that drought with Danzig Connection, who gave Woody that fifth Belmont just a few months earlier. Gleaves, meanwhile, countered with Wise Times, whose late kick in the final strides enabled him to capture the Haskell at Monmouth, defeating Danzig Connection and Personal Flag. The Travers showdown between the teacher and the student was set, and on a sloppy racetrack, Wise Times reaffirmed his Haskell victory, once again coming from off the pace. He wore down Broadbrush in the last 16th of a mile to nail down the victory. Broadbrush would be disqualified and placed fourth for interfering with personal flag in the stretch. Jockey Jerry Bailey, covered with mud from head to toe, was all smiles after the race, having nailed down his first Travers win. Nineteen eighty-seven marked the first million dollar Travers, and the quality of the field matched the purse. In what was one of the most awaited matchups in years, the Travers drew Derby and Preakness winner Ali Sheba. Belmont Stakes and Haskell Victor bet twice. Multiple grade one winner Crypto Clearance. Temperate Sill, winner of the Swap Stakes. Jim Dandy winner Polish Navy. The Leroy Jolly trained Gulch and Whitney handicap winner Java Gold, who had missed the Triple Crown events. Summer rains had once again turned the racetrack to a sea of slop, and Java Gold loved it. With a strong burst in the stretch, Java Gold caught crypto clearance at the 16th pole and drew off to an impressive two-length victory with Polish Navy a well-beaten third. For the Rokeby stable of Paul Mellon, it was their fourth Travers win, matching the total wins of the Dwyer brothers in the Midsummer Derby, and only one short of George D. Widener's five Travers wins. Pat Day was winning his second Travers, and he would soon add to that total. The call to post for the 88 Travers was met with great anticipation. Just a few weeks earlier in Monmouth's Haskell, 49er and Seeking the Gold had established a new rivalry when they raced head and head for a mile before 49er prevailed by a nose. The stage was set for a rematch in the Travers, but the favorites role went to James W. Phillips' Brian's time, winner of Saratoga's Jim Dandy. Marshall Cassidy once again makes the call of the race. Barrel. Seeking the gold on the rail, going for the lead on the outside is 49er, right alongside, and 49er gets a narrow lead. It's seeking the gold on the rail, back into second, about three to King Post, then Dynaformer, about two to Brian's time and evening Chris. They race in three distinct groups into the clubhouse turn. It's 49er on the outside, seeking the gold on the inside, and seeking the gold now gets the lead by out. 49er has dropped into second to buy three, King Post third, then Dynaformer about three to Evening Chris, and Brian's time is sixth. The quarter and 24 and one, and they approach the backstretch. Now Dynaformer moves on the outside of 49er and seeking the gold, and those three are across the track. They have a length and a half on King Post, fourth by three, then Evening Chris and Brian's time down the backstretch. And now it's 49er getting the lead again by a Dynaformer on the outside is second by about a length, and King Post is moving into third. Seeking the gold on the rail has dropped into fourth. The half and 48 and three, they continue down the backstretch. 49er leads by a neck. Dynaformer on the outside, second by a length. Farther out is King Post in third by a half. Seeking the gold remains in fourth on the rail by two. Then evening Chris and Brian's time as they round the far turn. Three quarters, 13 and one. 49er leads by a neck. Dynaformer on the outside, second to buy two. Brian's time has moved up on the inside of Evening Chris. Seeking the gold remains on the rail. They're at the top of the stretch. The mile 37-4. 4. 49er has the lead on the outside. Here comes Brian's time farther out. Evening Chris on the rail is seeking the gold. They're at the eighth pole. 49er leads clearly by two. Seeking the gold moves into second on the outside. Brian's time. Brian's time seeking the gold. Getting ground on the outside of 49er. Loose three past 16th pole. It's seeking the gold and 49er to the wire. Seeking the gold and 49er. 49er on the inside. The Travers was a virtual rerun of the Haskell 
with Claiborne Farms 49er besting Ogden Phipps' Seeking the Gold by a Nose. And jockey Chris McCarron had ridden a perfect race when perfection was needed. In the winner's circle was Hall of Fame trainer Woody Stevens. He finally got the one race that had eluded him for so many years, the Midsummer Derby. The large crowd that gathered at Saratoga for the 89 Travers came to see the horse that had put it all together, Easy Goer. He was indeed New York's horse. After suffering a disappointing loss at the hands of Sunday Silence in the Derby and a bitter nose defeat to that same rival in the Preakness, Easy Goer was on a roll. He thrashed his arch enemy in the Belmont Stakes by eight lengths and was coming into the Travers off an easy score in the Whitney Handicap just two weeks earlier. His five opponents in the mile and a quarter Travers were no match for the powerful son of Ali Dar as he flew down the stretch to post a workmanlike three-length victory over a stubborn, clever Trevor. Easy Goer became the 26th horse to capture the Belmont Travers double and just the fourth horse to win both the Whitney and Travers the same season, joining Key to the Mint, Ali Dar, and Java Gold. He also gave owner Ogden Phipps his second Travers trophy, while Pat Day was winning his third Midsummer Derby of the decade. The 80s had ended on a high note for the Travers stakes, and the Midsummer Derby was ready to roll into the 90s.